This is the corner of Canal Street and Dixie Highway, a location near which Florida East Coast Railway built a passenger station that would change the face of our community forever. It was the beginning of a new era in railroad transportation that has served Southeast Volusia County for over a century. Hello, I'm Greg Holbrook. Welcome to the first of our two-part series on railroading in New Smyrna Beach. This is the story of how the FEC came to New Smyrna back in the early 1890s and how it developed into the thriving freight carrier we see rumbling along these rails today. Our timeline begins in 1883 with Henry Flagler, a man whose name is synonymous with the development of Florida. This wealthy industrialist and partner in the Standard Oil Empire decided to visit St. Augustine on a honeymoon trip. Lured by its tropical climate and old world charm, Flagler took a liking to Florida's oldest city, even though he considered its hotels and transportation woefully inadequate. Flagler came back to St. Augustine in 1885 with the idea of building a grand hotel. He believed this historic colonial capital could be converted into a winter retreat for wealthy northerners. But Flagler soon realized that construction of such lavish resorts would require a reliable system of railroads. Flagler bought up several small railroads in northeast Florida. He converted their different track sizes to standard gauge, new engines and passenger cars were purchased, stations and signaling systems were modernized. By September 1895, Flagler's railroad vision became a reality as the predecessor of the Florida East Coast Railway was born. Under Flagler's leadership, Jacksonville would become the gateway for trains entering Florida, and St. Augustine would be the headquarters of his railroad empire. Henry Flagler was an ambitious man, and his plans for the development of luxury hotels in St. Augustine were only the beginning. After completion of the Ponce de Leon Hotel in 1888, Flagler began to seek other desirable locations for hotels and resorts further south. Soon, tracks were being laid from Volusia County down to present-day Palm Beach. The foundation for railroading in New Smyrna had been established. Our town's coastal location became the ideal spot for refueling locomotives and changing train crews. One of Flagler's early acquisitions, the Jacksonville, St. Augustine and Indian River Railway, inaugurated passenger service here on November 2nd, 1892. Three years later, on September 8th, 1895, Flagler renamed his railroad the Florida East Coast Railway. With the extension of Flagler's railroad to Miami in 1896 and Key West in 1912, Florida was soon transformed into a renowned vacation destination. Within three decades, a dozen trains from cities such as New York and Chicago would travel down these rails every day around the clock. Eventually, trains with famous names such as Dixie Flagler, City of Miami, Florida Special, and the Miamian became New Smyrna's link to the outside world. The first New Smyrna station, as seen in these early photos, was built in a wooded area on the east side of the tracks. This engraving of that location appeared in a Jacksonville newspaper, the Florida Times Union, back in 1893. This station was eventually expanded in the following years. Then, to keep up with overwhelming demand, it became necessary to build a second station on the west side of the tracks. In addition to larger areas for passengers and baggage, this building featured a two-story section that housed railroad offices and the East Coast Restaurant a popular gathering place for local residents as well as out-of-state passengers. New Smyrna's rail yard also grew over time. It started out as a simple facility for supplying water and fuel. These pioneers of steam burned wood, coal, and eventually oil. These are some of the first engines that date back to 1892. It is believed that engines 10, 11, and 12 were the first to bring train service down the East Coast all the way to Miami. Other than photographs, nothing remains of that first generation of locomotives. Most were sold to private companies such as U.S. Sugar Corporation or relegated to the scrap heap. However, engines 113 and 153 are still in existence. They were acquired and restored by the Gold Coast Railroad Museum in Miami. 
These big oil burning engines were the workhorses of the FEC for most of the 1920s and 30s. These beautifully restored machines are still housed and displayed at the Gold Coast Museum. The Miami Museum also houses another piece of railway history. Passenger Car 136 is a prime example of an older style heavyweight car used to carry passengers in and out of New Smyrna back in those early days. It was bought by the FEC in 1925 and used in service into the early 1950s. Unlike the luxurious Pullman cars, so well known for their dining and sleeping accommodations, Car 136 offered its passengers a more simplified approach to rail travel, well before the age of air conditioning and Wi-Fi. Barbara Safudo from our museum staff has more on these cars and Henry Flagler's partnership with another business tycoon of the day, George Pullman. I think the biggest thing that happened was Mr. Flagler realized he needed Pullman cars because now the, the trip was taking more than 24 hours. And that was okay, but he had to have a discussion with Mr. Pullman. Everything had to go through Mr. Pullman. And so they talked about it and he said, now Henry, you know, I don't sell my Pullman cars. I'll lease them to you, but I run them the way I want them run. And he did. And he said, we only use black folks on our railroad cars. They work very hard, they like the work, and what I've done is I've made it so they will be up all night. How did he make it so they would be up all night? Well, in the old Pullman cars, and in some of the newer ones too, um, there's like a milk box, you know what that was like? It had a door on the outside, door on the inside, well, it was big enough for a man to put his shoes and they would get shined. If he had perhaps pulled off a button, he'd put the shirt and the button in, it would get fixed. All the small little repair things like that. And so in the morning, there they would be, ready for him to use and fixed. As with much of American commerce, the 1920s were considered banner years for railroading in Florida. By 1926, the Florida East Coast was running 12 passenger trains a day through New Smyrna. Lumber and farm products were also being shipped along its ever-expanding freight routes. Total revenues topped $29 million. Because of this tremendous growth, the FEC's fleet of steam engines and passenger cars had to be constantly inspected and maintained. With the construction of a nine-stall roundhouse in 1925, New Smyrna became a state-of-the-art maintenance hub for the entire East Coast Line. The new engine terminal included a machine shop, a powerhouse, and several other buildings needed for freight and warehouse operations. The railroad quickly became the engine that drove the local economy. Hotels and resorts catering to seasonal tourists soon dotted the area. Well-known names such as the Riverview Hotel and the Ocean House became places where northerners could escape the cold winter months. Sportsmen traveled here for the hunting and fishing. New businesses were started in what would become New Smyrna's downtown commercial district, centered around Canal Street and Orange Avenue. Here's Barbara Safudo on how the FEC impacted the lives of local residents throughout Southeast Volusia, from Edgewater down to Oak Hill. First of all, they put a tiny little station, a weight station. It only had to be big enough for not many people. So that was different. And they were on the schedule then. Then they knew when the, the uh, train would be coming. And they could plan out their trip because now they could actually go to Daytona, which was a big deal, and do shopping in um, the bigger stores that were in Daytona. So New Smyrna grew because of that and certainly Canal Street grew because now Canal Street had stores all the way from the river almost to Mission Road. Those early years of cross-country train travel may have seemed exciting and adventuresome, but they were also marred by the social injustices of their time. In the South, racial segregation and Jim Crow laws from the turn of the century kept black and white passengers from traveling together or even sharing the same facilities. Black employees, including the firemen, porters, and laborers, had to suffer the indignity 
of being treated as second-class workers. R.Z. Rogers was a train porter and fireman back in 1952. It was so inhumane. Now here we are, locomotive fireman, going into Fort Pierce on the same train. The brakeman, the flagman, everybody could go in that restaurant and the only way that we, and the best chill in the world was made right there in that little restaurant right across from the railroad track. That mm -hmm. woman could make that chill in. They had a little hole in the wall mm -hmm. with all the garbage can and, and that stuff, that. And that, that's right. And we could not go in and sit down and have a bowl of chili, a cup of coffee, and other guys in there just having a great time. You had to go in that, and you couldn't do that when a lot of us refused to do it. Unlike other railroads and businesses in the South, the FEC was an unwilling participant in these unfair and outdated practices which were required by state law. However, even with those statutes in place, the railroad was still looked on as a source of valuable jobs by black wage earners and their families. First paycheck some of them got, they had never seen that much money. They, was that true? One of them went to the city, going down the street holding the money in their hand. I don't know, never made it. They, I mean, they say they literally did that. Yes, sir, down, you know, so many business places uh, down there on Demick and Julia. And say they, man, they just, those people were so happy about that, you know, and they never made that much money before. Barbara Zafudo says, this steady source of employment and income led to the creation of black neighborhoods and a true sense of community on New Smyrna's historic west side. The, the people who worked on the train as porters, they had to somehow, Mr. Flagler had to get them to come down here. So what Mr. Pullman suggested is pay them Chicago wages. That's what they were making up north pay them the same thing to come down here. They'll come down, and they did. And it was not equal to Canal Street, but there were restaurants, there were hotels, there was even a hospital on the west side. And of course, as we all know, all the black folks had to get off on the west side of the tracks. So that was a good beginning for the west side. Unfortunately, it would be many decades before the struggle for civil rights would begin to reverse the segregation and discrimination of the early 1900s. Throughout the middle of the 20th century, the pace of social and economic change in American society began to accelerate. The boom years of financial prosperity, real estate development, and train travel would soon be altered in very profound ways. FEC historian Seth Bramson writes in his book, Speedway to Sunshine, about the major events in South Florida, which caused railroad traffic and profits to decline. Those events included major hurricanes and a massive shipping embargo, which halted most railroad traffic in the state. Revenues dropped to 14 million in 1928. The Great Depression came along in 1929 and earnings sank even further to seven million by 1933. The FEC was now facing competition from other railroads, such as the Seaboard Airline, with its famous Orange Blossom Special. While the demand for travel and tourism plummeted, the FEC faced a mounting debt problem brought on by its efforts to modernize. Those upgrades included double tracking of the entire main line and a new electric signaling system. Expenditures for the purchase of new steam locomotives and passenger cars were added to the debt. Unable to pay its creditors, the FEC was forced to declare bankruptcy in 1931. The financial constraints of receivership would last another 30 years. This and other events in South Florida, particularly hurricanes, continued to have a ripple effect on train service here. Demand for service was greatly impacted by the Great Labor Day Hurricane of 1935, which wiped out 42 miles of the Key West Extension. Henry Flagler's successors were never able to rebuild the Oversea Railroad after that fatal disaster. Despite facing numerous financial challenges, the FEC decided it was time to phase out steam locomotives and upgrade to new diesel power. Barb Zafudo says this transition had a major impact on how railroads such as the FEC conducted their operations. Going from anthracite to uh, fuel oil was even bigger because now 
cities couldn't say or wouldn't say you can't run your railroad down here because all these people have nice houses and it's going to be smelly and awful that was gone now so that made a huge difference in first of all where they could put their tracks how they could negotiate with the city to put their railroad there in the first place um, it was very interesting and the, that all started in the 20s actually up north didn't get here till much later but it started in the 20s up north. George McClendon, a retired fireman with the FEC, describes his experience of being there for the last days of steam. I had the good fortune, my crew in Jacksonville, to take the last four of the steam engines on the entire system. Mm -hmm. We hooked them together and we took them over to Jacksonville mm -hmm. and we dropped them off to be cut up for, for scrap mm -hmm. iron. And uh, I tell you, I almost cried because it's like taking four oh, old friends to the graveyard oh, yeah. and dropping them off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was quite an experience. Yes, it was. Quite With a fleet of new diesel engines and a rebound in business at the end of World War II, FEC management thought it had steered the company back on track. However, indications of new labor strife loomed on the horizon. The conditions that set the stage for major changes in the railroad industry will be covered in the second half of our presentation. Until then, for the New Smyrna Museum of History, I'm Greg Holbrook.